been announced yet. Has anybody heard anything? Hello, Andre Srinath from Singapore. Hello, welcome. Very good. Thank you. Andre, hi, Lakshman from Dubai. Lakshman, hello. Hi, how are you? This is a global webinar, thank you. Coming over from all, all over the world. Yeah. Andre, how are you? Very good. Who is this, please? <laughs> Alfonso. Alfonso. Oh, yeah. Hello, very good to have you, Alfonso. <laughs> Welcome, Kredimpex. Yeah, thank you so much. So I suggest we. Hi, Alfonso. Good, good uh, evening. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Andre. Hello, Achille. Hi. Hi. Very good. It's a very good test to being able to recognize people based on the voice only. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> this, 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 these times are amazing. Uh, very interesting to discover new skills. So I suggest we start. Uh, thanks to all of you uh, who, who joined on time and we have more people joining. We have actually 200 plus registrations from this webinar and, and getting to 100 participants as, as I'm speaking. Welcome to the ITFA uh, FinTech Committee webinar. My name is Andre Kasselman and I'm delighted to uh, welcome you to this uh, uh, second webi uh, actually third webinar organized by ITFA uh, following the COVID-19 uh, situation. Uh, I'm delighted to be on the core team of ITFA, which is uh, chaired by uh, Cheryl Edwards, who is with us today and, and part of the agenda contributing to this, uh, to this session. I hope you can all hear me well. What I'm going to do um, is to basically mute you all so that um, we, we avoid background noises. Of course, you can, you may unmute yourself in case of need but let's avoid having uh, background uh, noises indeed. For those of you who were invited to this webinar on discovering ITFA, uh, we are a, a neutral association, a global trade finance association representing the rights and interests of mainly financial institutions and all those institutions um, supporting financial institutions like uh, insurers, brokers, law firms, consultants. And recently indeed, we have had uh, many new uh, members, members coming from the non-bank originators, institutional funders, asset managers, as well as technology providers. And as you can see from those categories of new members, you, you see how the market is evolving towards uh, trade as an asset class, trade digitization, and, and far more technology being used. And that's why the membership has grown in those categories. Uh, the FinTech Committee, which uh, Sean established um, and asked me to run about three years ago, is now um, uh, including those uh, 23 uh, technology providers. Uh, you, you see them on the logos here. I won't go through uh, them. We have a, a deck that is detailing all of those value propositions that we published about six months ago. In case uh, of interest, it's on, available on the website of, of ITFA. Definitely, uh, the COVID-19 has introduced quite challenging times uh, for us on the trade finance side. And most importantly, uh, during the first webinar we organized with Straight Finance Global, we, we got some key messages across in the industry, which we want to, reinforce, uh, to reinforce today. We talked about the transport challenge, the back office challenge, the legal challenge, and uh, highlighted at a very high level um, how technology solutions could address. But today, we think we want to go deeper into the available technologies and how they can support uh, facing some of those uh, challenges. And, and as I said during that first webinar, uh, uh, having worked for, for the last 15 years on uh, trade digitization and having faced a lot of um, uh, challenges to, to grow adoption, I think now the industry has a unique opportunity to uh, justify the, the investment required 
in digitization from a business continuity planning perspective, which is an additional driver for digitization. But often, as we will discuss today, uh, policy decisions are also required to, to enable. So if you want to get access to that uh, article that was published by SNP Global, uh, San Juas, uh, you can have access via the link. It's, uh, it's public on the website. Today, we have invited the following speakers uh, in order to enrich the debate, to share the challenges they face and the solutions they are already working on, but also not only looking at what is happening today and in the next few weeks, but also what must happen in the next few months to foster digitization. So I will let them uh, introduce themselves. You see their names on the slide here uh, as they start uh, speaking in the, in the next few uh, minutes. Um, with this, I'd like to hand over to Sean, uh, chair of ITFA and, and banker, and introduce us the focus of this session as well as the agenda on, on the next slide. I will navigate the slides uh, for, for your ease, Sean. Over to you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Andre, and thank you to all of you uh, for, for dialing in, uh, calling in, um, and view, videoing in for our third uh, webinar um, related to COVID-19. So, the, 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 the DNA of ITFA has always been to uh, come up with practical solutions. Uh, if you could get that one slide, thank you, Andre. Has always been to come up with practical solutions uh, to current problems, whilst at the same time working to change and create a better environment uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and better solutions for the future. Andre has mentioned policy changes, and I'll come on to that. But one of the things that's very important, one of the few, I think, few silver linings of this global pandemic is that it has become a catalyst for, uh, for the increased use of technology in trade generally, but specifically in trade finance operations. Um, and that involves a number of different things from processing, from OCR uh, reading of, of documents to actually executing documents in, uh, in the first place and making that and integrating that into a very smooth uh, straight through process. Um, uh, all of these different parts, I think we're all aware, we were joking beforehand how we've all become experts at using these, this webinar technology. So uh, a crisis like this really does accentuate and accelerate the, um, the, the adoption. One of the things that we don't have to do now, um, and I speak here now as a banker rather than as chair of ITFA, is actually to sell um, our platforms, the technology platforms, such as, for example, uh, Marco Polo, uh, to, to our customers. So already, as Andre has said, BCP, business continuity planning, uh, is extremely important now for everybody to an extent that maybe it wasn't uh, a few months ago. Um, and so already we find uh, a, a, a large part of the, uh, of the work that we have to do with clients um, done for us. Uh, but what are we offering them? What are the, the technical te technology solutions and are they available? Um, I think for it to be a, a really powerful and holistic solution to all these problems, they have to be able to integrate um, a lot of different tools and deal with a lot of the problems we have. So for example, AYC, uh, KYC AML, um, com compliance, uh, due diligence checking and, and, and all of this stuff that we've grown to love and hate over the years, but which certainly is not going away. Um, that is something that needs to be integrated and can be integrated into the platforms that we, that we have. Over the last couple of weeks, we've seen a lot of focus on, um, on electronic signatures. Um, and that's not surprising because people have needed to get deals that were already in the pipeline uh, over the line um, and, uh, and completed. Um, but actually, uh, when you think about it, digital signatures are only one part of the overall uh, of the overall process. So clearly, there's a lot of help that uh, digitization can provide for the back office. Um, generally speaking, this has been very manual. Um, but what we found, um, and this is of course now that uh, the the pandemic is beginning to hit um, very hard in places like India, a lot of uh, of uh, offshore um, uh, offshore processing centers are also being affected. So we need that technology as part of our operational resilience. Um, what will it take for banks to adopt these technologies? Well, I think, as I said already, 
that there is a, a large part of the work has been done um, by by the uh, by the uh, by the pandemic. It normally takes at least, I'm sure a lot of you will know this, that it takes six months to a year or even longer sometimes just to make the business case. But if the business case is there now and is accepted by the users, what about the fintechs? We're very pleased to have a couple of them here. They need to step up to the plate um, in a very big and very serious way. So it's an opportunity. Um, it's also a challenge for them. And we'll hear from some of them who are providing some of the solutions later on today. Uh, I've mentioned policy changes. As many of you know, I'm, 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 my day job is as a lawyer and I follow a lot of the uh, a lot of the legal changes that need to happen um, and as part of ITFA and we'll talk about this later as part of it we also lobby quite quite widely uh, to to change the law now sometimes I'll take uh, e-signatures as an example there is sometimes only a very little that you need to do but it's that last mile that last link that actually scuppers the whole thing so uh, if you have a port that won't accept uh, that won't accept digitized bills of lading, for example, that's it, the whole process falls apart. So uh, at the end of this, uh, we want, uh, with your input, um, your comments, please use the chat facility. Uh, we want to create a call to action. Um, how should we come together? What needs to change? Uh, with that, I'll pass back to, to Andre, and we'll, we'll, start the, and we'll start the agenda with looking at the challenges from the point of view of our customers, the corporates. Thank you, Sean. Let's start first with the, the, the challenges from the corporate view and from the banker's view. We'll then look at the critical uh, future policy changes that are required in order for more technology options to be uh, relevant to uh, address those issues. So with this, I'd like to hand over to Yari Hanninen, Head of Structured Finance at uh, Nokia Corporation, to tell us his view uh, from the, the corporate side. Yari? Yeah, you. okay. <clears throat> Thanks, Andre, and, and hello to everybody. So uh, my name is Yari Hanin, and I've been actually heading the structured finance credit products in Nokia for <clears throat> over 20, or being actually employed by Nokia over 23 years, and, and will be actually leaving Nokia <clears throat> now in May, but uh, but for having this opportunity to, to, to have this presentation regarding, in a way, how the corporates are considering the digital trade. I'm, I'm talking about digital trade here shortly and, and then in a way there are references made to COVID decision, uh, COVID situation as well. So uh, what do we actually mean by digital trade? So <clears throat> somebody can actually consider it's, it's uh, some type of one of document which, which is in a way digitized and, and then we are starting to use that. I think that's definitely part of the of the process and, and, and the development. But also some people like, like like myself possibly consider that we should consider um end to end processes, uh whether we are talking about the guarantees or LCs and who is doing what in, in different phases and, and uh, in this process. So that that is of course much wider. Uh, perspective but uh, in order to make this happen I think in a way we would need also to look into a little bit uh, uh, wider perspective and, and considering what are the parties that we need to cooperate with in order to make it happen. So uh, from corporate's point of view uh, this this is not related to Nokia as, as such but uh, how I have been um, discussing with several corporates and 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 I, I think you know what I have been actually putting here as corporate challenges apply also to banks. Uh, how to develop their trade finance processes and and um, in a way uh, trade flows and and, and all, all 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 what they are doing. So it's quite a fuzzy picture and and it's quite difficult actually to get get grip on this. Uh, in order to understand what the future may be and, and actually work towards that. Um, in many corporates, so that the operations are very decentralized, uh, ownerships are not necessarily very clear in uh, multinational corporates, 
because there are so many parties who are uh, participating in this in the, in, the, in the process itself. So my <clears throat> suggestion is, is the more centralization you have, the better. Um, end-to-end process understanding if this is difficult for for trade finance and and in this trade finance world so this is also difficult within the corporates in it, especially in the in the big ones um, utilization of trade finance service platform providers and uh, nokia has been using actually quite long already uh, these providers and especially in this type of uh, coronavirus situation so i think in a way we are very lucky ones because you can in a way um, eff efficient efficiently actually follow up the trade flows and and uh, and what is needed to be done also from from remote um, work um, business plan challenge uh, when you enter into <clears throat> business with different uh, type of service providers so it is actually quite difficult to make a business plan which is flying well from the beginning or after two years time or something like that i think in a way this may change actually going further andre was referring to this as well that this virus situation may change our attitudes and possibly we will actually get more support from the top management in the corporates uh, regarding this type of uh, uh, development uh, further um, if you are in early adoption phase whether you are a bank or a corporate it's actually quite a risky and difficult situation however i would actually encourage all <clears throat> all of you be more um, not not too risk averse but but trying to do actually things in order to develop flexibility <clears throat> this is an issue that then when you are starting to enter into agreements with several uh, service providers. So you need to consider, are you integrating actually their solutions into your ERPs or are you creating some type of API solutions? How do you retain the flexibility in this world? Uh, my personal view is that uh, when you are entering into this type of web-based solutions, you have more flexibility also for the future and, and then you can in a way do the changes as things will develop further support from uh, regulators and policy holders this is a big issue and, and i <clears throat> personally i do not know um, whether corporates or the banks are supported sufficiently by <clears throat> by these parties I think in a way we need to speed up there in order to <clears throat> make this digital trade happen. Um, and, and also in, in the process, of course, there are different, uh, ITFICE is a very good example of this. So we have been able as corporates also to say and technology solution providers, uh, <clears throat> and they are listening to us and, and together we need to cooperate in order to make things develop further. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> support from banks i think many corporates are considering that banks know all this stuff very well and, and they can support you as, as things develop further i'm afraid <clears throat> this is not the situation and and i think you know the banks are also considering challenges so once again i would underline the cooperation let's consider these issues together what makes sense and and uh, what can actually wait until further notice um, and and then <clears throat> in a way not being too risk averse but but uh, but in a way trying and and learn and the next slide thanks okay then this um, current uh, virus situation so uh, of course in the cop on the corporate side and I'm, I'm now referring of course to, to trade finance and not <clears throat> let's say wider in the on the corporate side how can we ensure, in a way, the continuation uh, with the export LCs and, and guarantees? We need to be able to arrange guarantees in order to continue the business. We need to uh, get, in a way, um, export LCs confirmed, discounted, and, and also documents presented. So if this situation is totally new, uh, there have been some references made already regarding India and 
some difficulties there with the DHL and, 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 and the likes. Um, so this this is having, of course, immediate impact to the, your cash flow. So this is very important issue. <clears throat> So uh, bankers are not, I think on, on Nokia side and in many, in some, some of the corporates, I think, you know, this remote work has been quite, um, uh, quite, let's say, usual uh, every now and then, but on the bankers side, this is a little bit uh, different, uh, it, uh, different issue. I, I, can, I can say that I have been actually very happy with the, with the bankers' attitudes and, and the attitude to support the corporates in this difficult situation. Um, and, and of course, as, as mentioned, so if you are using this type of web-based solution providers and trade, for, trade finance service platforms, so you can more easily adapt into this type of situation. How this coronavirus will then impact in the longer term? I think this definitely has been a wake-up call for all of us. And, and we need to do something. And these viruses are emerging every now and then, almost on a regular basis. So hopefully we are not getting anything similar uh, soon, but uh, the risk is there. We need to uh, play, safe, play safe also in that respect. Um, remote work culture implications. Uh, when you are working from home <clears throat> several weeks, so you can, you can see that implications so i'm not sharing <laughs> sharing the camera with you at the moment but uh, but uh, you you know what i i mean and especially if you have children um close cooperation is needed i was underlining this already between different players in order to make this digital trade happen in the future all the parties are, are needed uh, the regulators and uh, it for banks corporates technology so solution providers you name it. Uh, I think both need, are, are needed to, to take place. We need organic development regarding different documents and templates to be digitized, um, uh, electronic signatures and, and, and so on. But we also need some game-changing uh, innovations in order to, to provide something with, because you cannot, in a way, necessarily change the manual work uh, I'm now referring, for instance, to letter of credit, uh, um, let's say document <coughs> uh, checking and, and this type of solution. So this from my, my side and happy to, happy to comment if you have anything to do. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Yari. Let's uh, hear now from the bankers, uh, starting with uh, John. Uh, what are the challenges that you, you face today? And then we'll, we'll follow on with uh, Vinod and, and Samuel. John, over to you. John, can you hear us? Or can you unmute yourself? Can you hear me now? Yes, very good. Can you hear me now? Yes. Sorry, I apologize. It's okay. Yeah. It was a great presentation up to there, my, my speaking. Anyway, <laughs> look, I, I, there's, there's a statement in the U.S. that you, you know, you never want to waste a, a good crisis. And it's amazing how COVID-19 has really highlighted, you know, just massive shortfalls in, in, in how we as an industry and even city as a bank handles trade finance and, and, and our trade business, right? City believes that, um, you know, we're we're one of we're a very innovative bank. We've been using you know imaging for for decades. We we deploy OCR, etc. But what became really amazing in this uh, pandemic is the fact that we had so many shortfalls. You know, the first is our entire business is still even after all this innovation, our business is still very very FTE driven, right? We still have large amounts of of staff located around the world. You know, some of our, our operations are outsourced to third party providers who did not really have remote access to our systems. We also had, you know, problems with bandwidth and trying to get everyone remote. And some of our systems worked um, extremely well. Some of them worked really, really poorly. So that was a huge issue. Uh, the other issue that we had was, you know, we, we still, 
even in today's world, uh, really rely on wet signatures for, for many, many of the transactions we do. Our clients are now, you know, working from home remote. They don't have the ability. So one of the things that, you know, we've been able to innovate relatively quickly is our, business, our ability to take digital signatures. But it was extremely expensive getting legal opinions in various jurisdictions, et cetera. The other thing that I think it really kind of um, highlighted for us was the, the lack of, of governance and rules. We had a variety of clients um, declare a force majeure. Unfortunately, the legal framework on a force majeure usually requires a government to call a force majeure. Very few governments actually called one. So now we're in legal conversations with a variety of clients saying, you know, you don't have the ability to call that kind of, uh, of clause and, and, you know, exactly what do we do? We also had the problem with the ICC, right? Um, the ICC really has guidelines as, you know, what you can do with documents if they're not presented or if they are presented in a certain period of time. But again, the question is, there's a force majeure clause, but there's no guidelines as to who can, you know, actually call that, that force majeure. So there, there's been a variety of issues. We've also, you know, had the challenges that many of you have that when we've gone to clients and talked to them about digitization and, you know, e-documents, uh, there really wasn't much uh, take up. Uh, many clients said, oh, that's very interesting, but I don't want a single bank solution or, you know, we're not really ready for that, et cetera. So I do think we're in a very, very unique um, position. One of the things that we're doing um, at City is we're going back and looking at all the, the fintechs like TradeStream and, and others and saying, okay, so how do we deploy this technology in our business to make our, our operations you know, operationally scalable so that we don't have to have all these human beings, that it becomes a much, much more straight through process and I think, you know, there's going to be a, a lot of innovation that's going to happen. But I think the innovation has to happen not only with the fintechs, but also around the regulatory infrastructure, how we handle things like this in the past. So it's been, you know, a very interesting um, eye opener for us. One of the things that I think we're really concerned about now, and again, this is somewhat U.S. centric. But, you know, there's conversations that COVID-19 may come back again in the fall. So it looks like we've hit our apex and are starting to come down. But, you know, if this comes back again in six months or whatever, which these, you know, viruses typically do, will we be in a better position then than where we are now? So that's really the goal that we're striving for. So with that, I'll stop and turn it to my colleagues. Thank you, John. Uh, let's hear from uh, Vinod, indeed. Hi, hi. Thanks, Andre. Thanks, John. Uh, I think John's pretty much covered the whole thing. I would think of it in two themes. Impact on the corporate clients um, and kind of, let's say, the FI clients in terms of what's happening in some of the markets. Uh, Nigeria comes to mind. Uh, the second theme being impact on people. In terms of corporates, uh, clearly, an unprecedented amount of uh, need for working capital financing driven by you know, extending cash conversion cycles. We see that happening all, all around the footprint, all the markets uh, in Africa. Um, the operational aspects of engagement have changed. John's already touched upon that DHL. For example, in South Africa, the DHL uh, official position is that they will only ship medicines. Uh, which leads to everything that kind of John spoke to about how do we take electronic signatures and so on and so forth. Um, we have activated, uh, shall I say, BCP. But that's a nice thing. I mean, that, that's a nice segue to move to people, the impact on people. Uh, our corporate clients, number of markets in Africa are in lockdown, which means different things for different people. But what it typically means is the corporate it's normal way of working doesn't doesn't is not allowed. Uh, a typical way, especially as you go further down the chain, move into SME or mid market clients, it becomes even more difficult. Where a face conversation is almost always important. Um, 
we have activated bcp which then comes with its own problems most importantly that a lot of our staff members were actually coming into work carrying the risk of contracting the virus it brings a totally different angle to the whole situation um i think as banks kind of uh, this is something that has been covered but i personally feel very strongly about is that uh, and completely to john's observation around never leaving a crisis go to waste this is a great opportunity and an almost a moral obligation for us in the banking industry to start knocking the doors of the regulators um uh, uh two days back icc came out with a potential way of approaching regulators which is basically to ask them to say please waive all legal requirements for paper documents i mean if we don't if we if we as a banking industry don't have that conversation with our, the regulators in our markets i think we are almost doing injustice there um my take is that in all these situations the arrow is pointing towards of what all of us would agree to which is digitizing trade we have to find a way where in a market the key banks get together and say that we will aim to aim to kind of fully digitize and for a change now both the clients and the regulators would actually be willing to walk the extra mile with us i think i'll pause there and uh, back to you andre thank you vinod let's indeed move on to uh, samuel of standard chartered over to hey, you samuel um, andre thank you thank you andre and and uh, hi everyone so look i, I think john and vinod have covered quite a few points on the slide uh, to my mind there are three themes and i'll only talk about the first one today given the topic but broadly the impact um that we are seeing is around the operational uh, items uh, which i think john alluded to uh, liquidity and and the and the and the stress on that liquidity and the third one which actually worries me the most um is is a credit risk element and you'll only see that at the, at the tail end of this virus impact going into q3 and maybe beyond and i'm starting to see some big signs of that and you may hear some news um in the in the media uh, especially with oil names um you know from from singapore etc now let's move focus on the operational side now talking about, about operational and this which is where the digital digital angle comes in I, I think um, uh, both John and um, we know touched on this. We tend to look at it in two. Let's look at it in two parts, right? The way the clients, our clients, connect to us, and then how we, as a bank, then connect to counterparty, which is other banks and and maybe non non client counterparties. In the first bucket, there has been such a sudden demand. You know, clients that uh, we have been trying to get onto our uh, proprietary internet banking uh, or, or or you know similar platforms. Uh, are you know now looking to, for the same solution and talking to us and not just talking to us they're they're signing up on on, on these solutions uh, which was slow burn uh, earlier so clearly there's an increased demand and and more than a demand there's an increased willingness on um, when it comes to client corporate clients uh, signing up to uh, multiple digital channels including the banks uh, on uh, proprietary platform a second is a more complicated area uh, about where banks are talking uh, dealing with other counterparties and typically involves uh, you know uh, transfer of title documents and original title documents which is typically paper now you know there um, um you know is the technology there i think most of the banks and the corporates involved uh, have dabbled with everything from ocr to nlp to apis to uh, blockchain and 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 Uh, any of the banks on this forum and even corporates would be part of many of these um, you know pilot pocs uh, even live platforms and consortiums i think the um, the the point that john was making is very very uh, uh, crucial i think the lack of standards and i know icc is working on that um, um, uh, with the imda here in singapore for example to uh come up with urdt or uniform rules for digital trade um and the unicitral model law that was publi- published years ago i think that needs to translate uh, into something that becomes universal i think the real challenge we have is not the lack of technology but how do we get all these digital islands to talk to each other because there's only so many uh, us banks or even our corporate clients uh, will be able to join so um it, it takes me back to 1973 when um you know banks used to settle interbank payments via telex and then 273 banks came together and and swift was born and mt um 100 was born we need to get to that 
equivalent in the digital paradigm today about how we're going to do tidal transfers and electronic um, uh, you know, documents flowing uh, seamlessly, albeit they may be on different platforms because the technology do exist. So let me uh, just pause there. Obviously, with the lockdown, everybody is working from home. Our clients are working from home, and we have had to improvise and be creative about how they connect to us, uh, depending on the market, and how we deal with other banks uh, in situations where uh, I think to an earlier point, couriers wouldn't pick up documents, etc. And there are ways around that, but you know these are operationally intensive ways as well. And uh, so we need to come up with a common language, and uh, because the technology will adapt once the language is established. And so, so to my mind, one one key theme theme is the legal framework and the standards that need to evolve to to uh, make this adoption possible. Let me just stop there, and then we can come back if there are more questions. Thank you, Samuel. So thank you to the the three of you. We'll come back to you for for more. Uh, uh, insights, of course. Let's first indeed look at uh, the critical future policy changes, uh, future or ongoing policy changes, because some central banks have already taken some decisions to enable digital uh, exchange of documents, for instance. But let, let's hear from uh, Sean, taking his hat as a lawyer, uh, looking at the, the policy changes that have been already taken and are being discussed. Sean? Over yes, to you. Thank, thank you, Andre. Uh, that was a very interesting discussion because it's touched on a number of points, which uh, some of which maybe I can try and answer here. Uh, there aren't solutions to everything at the moment. What's interesting is that there is, as Samuel's mentioned, a lot of work that is going on through associations such as it, uh, the ICC, uh, and the WTO. Uh, we've got all of those organizations' logos down here because everybody is really, really busy in this space. Um, I'm nostalgically thinking of my last uh, major physical meeting that I had prior to the lockdown, and that was a meeting with the Law Commission here in England, looking at e-signatures. So let's just go through all of these uh, because they all touch on different aspects. But I think the overall wrap to this is I think that there has to be a global solution, a global approach and a global solution. Some of these people, such as the WTO, are good entry points. Um, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, but uh, it, sometimes we have to push and sometimes we have to pull. Sometimes it's top down and sometimes it's bottom up. So let's start with e-signatures. Uh, I hope that most of you on the call will have got uh, the guidance that we distributed uh, last week. And in fact, there was a, a second email in relation to the MPA around e-signatures. Now we all were thrust into having to use digital signatures, electronic signatures, because we wanted to get pipeline deals completed. Uh, so we set out in that guidance how you can do this, but what's the, and one of these, one of the ways, which in fact in the first week of the lockdown proved to be the most popular, at least in my bank, was this uh, very um, homemade, if I can put it that way, uh, homemade uh, email signature solution where you uh, attach the document that you hadn't signed to an email and you signed it in inverted commas through the attached email. Now that works for a lot of contracts, not for all. John has explained how much money he spent going around the world, and that is indeed a big issue um, because some of these, uh, some of these uh, methods work and some don't. But the, the guidance then went on to talk about slightly more robust digital signatures that could be scanned in. Um, it's always a good sign when the law firms start producing uh, guidance about, about Things that are going on in the market because it means it's a it's a current problem. There's a, a, a there are, there was a lot of information being released by major law firms about the use of JPEG signatures. So people actually scanning their signatures using their phones um, and then attaching that in some way uh, to uh, to documents. Um, so that's where we that's where we uh, that's where we we sort of ended up trying to to make the best of a bad job. Um, the, the, the deeper background to this is, and I alluded to this uh, in my introduction, is that you can get a long way with a lot of uh, digital signatures, but then you find that there is one document or one registry or one country which doesn't accept it. Uh, in Europe, we're very lucky to have something called the EIDAS regulation, which is the Electronic Identification and Trust Regulation, which has been around for some time. If uh, the UNSA trial model law was mentioned, if you are familiar with the suite of laws that UNSA trial 
have been uh, pushing out over the last actually 15 years, you'll see a lot of the language in that. Um, and this essentially what it does is a basic level is it says you can't discriminate against an e-signature, but there's a very definite uh, policy uh, point that's reflected in that, which is that uh, the, 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 uh, uh, the, the wish of, of Brussels is to push everybody onto a system where uh, to, to the highest level of, um, of, of signature, uh, which is something called a qualified digital signature. And that requires the involvement of, you can call them digital notaries, but ex essentially external parties, trust service providers, as they're called, essentially third parties who, who, will, who will authenticate and validate your signature. And that's not something that many people have wanted to do. There's a cost, there's an extra degree of, of hassle there. Um, somebody else you have to involve. Um, I suspect now that people will think that that is slightly less uh, troublesome than it was a month ago, um, and it's worth it's it's worth making the uh, it's worth taking the extra step. But I think the the EIDAS is uh, under review at the moment in Brussels, and and hopefully it can it, we can get something a little bit more um, a little bit more uh, uh, user friendly. Uh, but I said I talked about the bottom up approach and the meeting that I had with the Law Commission. So uh, this is working with the ICC, uh, and this is very much about uh, smoothing out the rest of these bumps in the road. Um, now, uh, this is for English law, um, but English law is very widely used um, in, uh, in, um, uh, in international trade. And there are a lot of countries as well that follow uh, English law, the Commonwealth countries. Um, so hopefully it will have a ripple effect. Um, but as I guess, I'll go on to the, to the, to the, third, um, uh, the third circle here, the e-commerce rules. So at what point, if, if, it's, if there are people, pioneers like the UK and Europe, uh, but nevertheless, we, it's, it's not accepted uh, globally, uh, of course, the, the weak link uh, argument applies and the whole chain falls apart. So what's the good entry point? Uh, at the WTO, and I was being privileged to go down there a couple of times and speak during events such as e-commerce week. Uh, this is a very good entry point to get understanding and recognition of the rules that we need. And it's not just, by the way, about e-signatures. It's sometimes even more basic than that. It's about understanding or accepting the validity of digital writing. Can you have, regards to whether it's signed or not, do you need to have something on a piece of paper? Um, so this is a very good entry point, not only because through things like free trade agreements, um, the, uh, you, you can encourage adoption of, of these rules. And most of the free trade agreements now uh, contain something about e-commerce. A lot of it is focused on, uh, on, on, on data confidentiality and so on. Um, but increasingly, these, these important basic tools um, are, uh, are being encouraged through these agreements. Um, but it's also a very good listening post for the, for the government. So this is being fed back um, at quite a high level. Um, one thing that has sort of been uh, ignored a little bit, there's been a lot of discussion and, and, uh, about e-bills of lading. And of course, we have the two main um, uh, providers of e-bills of lading, one of whom is on this call, SDOT and Bolero. Um, uh, but uh, there are very similar problems around negotiable instruments. So promissory notes and bills of exchange. Uh, the UNSA trial model law that was mentioned, the model law, electronic transferable records, is actually a, uh, would actually cover both bills of lading and negotiable instruments. Though I mentioned at the beginning, um, this is something maybe that's going to happen in the medium to longer term. In ITFA, we are very keen about providing solutions to the here and now. So we have, uh, we are about to release a paper on how digital negotiable instruments or their functional equivalents um, can be uh, can be produced. Um, so watch out for that. I think we'll talk about that a little bit later, won't we, Andre? Um, but watch out for that coming out to it for members in the next couple of weeks. Um, John and a couple of others have mentioned ICC rules. Uh, the ICC has and the frustration around force majeure. Um, the paper that was released by the ICC a couple of days ago has essentially said as far as force majeure is concerned, and most of the paper is, by the way, uh, dedicated to 
uh, issues around presentation of documents, some of the things we talked about in the last panel, but on force majeure, what it said is, and you may say that they're, they're ducking the issue, but essentially what they said is it's down to each jurisdiction to decide. The, the, the policy that behind, uh, and it's very important to, to say this publicly, the policy that is behind this guidance uh, is that uh, if banks are open and they, they should remain open, there will not be force majeure. And it's important that we find uh, ways of solving presentation, uh, presentation of documents. Um, there is a lot of encouragement in that paper around uh, about switching to uh, e-presentation. So many of you will be aware of the EUCP, uh, which has gone down to a second edition, so it was modernized. Um, it is possible to move from a, from a paper-based uh, le uh, letter of credit to an EUCP letter of credit. But of course, the issue is at what point will somebody, it could be a shipper, it could be a port, it could be some sort of authority, a tax authority, a customs, if they require paper, that's not going to help you. So again, that is all part of this bigger issue around getting a global solution to this. Um, I mentioned uh, at the beginning digitizing uh, KYC, CDD and AML. Um, a lot of our members and have said to us and have said to people like the ICC, can't we just throw away all these rules or suspend them? Why do we have to do If you want us to finance SMEs, why is it that you are still holding us to the same very strict standards? I'm afraid to say, I don't think that that will work. Um, you may or may not want that, but uh, that is too well entrenched now as part of the banking landscape. The regulators have been very vocal uh, publicly and privately with banks about, about not letting standards slip. So uh, what we have to find is a way of making that more efficient. And that is, I think, what digitization has to offer because platforms um, and, and standards, common standards, offer an ability to plug in these different solutions um, in, a very efficient, uh, in a very efficient way, using uh, all sorts of data scraping tools um, and the like to get the best possible um, information on your customers. Um, I'll leave it there because that's quite a packed slide. Um, Suffice to say that uh, we are in, in it for working on all of these, either alone or with our partners. And uh, please stay tuned for the Digital Negotiable Instruments Initiative. We will be, we'll be publishing that in a week or so. Back to you, Andre. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Clearly, some uh, very short-term or recent uh, policy changes enabled to increase the use of, of uh, digital solutions. So, so the key question is uh, how to practically look at those uh, technology solutions, what kind of solutions can you uh, implement easily? And that's the goal of the, the next uh, section, starting with user uh, representing straight stream and uh, aiming to digitize back office operations. Uh, trade, uh, user, can you tell us more about uh, yes. how you can address those? Thank you, Andre. Challenges? Thank you so much. Thank you. And first of all, thank you everybody for talking. Thanks for it for obviously, first of all, for arranging it today and our esteemed um, amazing speakers who we all have the pleasure of, of working with as clients. And it's been uh, delighted to, to have you all speak today. So I think the first thing I wanted to say, and, and you know, and I say this, I seem to say this a lot over the last few weeks is that, you know, are we at an inflection point? And, and, and that's not me saying that. That's hearing from hundreds and hundreds of customers we speak to on a daily basis where we definitely see digital actually works. Um, I mean, many customers say, we wish we had done this earlier. I, and that's a common comment that's made. I wish we'd done this earlier. I wish we could have started this sooner. Um, and I think what was talked about as we want to do digital, we want to become digital, as almost a nice to have, as I say, has become very much a, we need to do this. And I don't think any of us anticipated what's happened in the last three weeks, four weeks, in the sense that people just can't get to the office. I was talking to clients in parts of the world where they physically cannot, they've got people going into the office to check documents because they just do not have anything set up to do anything at home. So, you know, John's point about amazing banks like City that have all the structure and set up to be able to do that. There are so many banks that don't have that. And, and actually, even for them and for the more sophisticated banks, the ability to be able to digitize today has become very, very real and very quick. Um, I think, you know, one of the big benefits of, of 
platforms like ours and the others you're going to speak to is the ability to be able to do almost a pay as you go model. I mean, we've gone into this world where everyone wants to pay as they go and not have big infrastructure costs and, and upfront costs. And I think we're seeing a lot of that today and the opportunities in the digital world. And so I think from a cost perspective, it makes sense. And in a world where capital is king, that's becoming a more important aspect. The value add it brings in terms of your BCP plans, your disaster recovery programs, and the efficiency that it brings, obviously, with that. So simple interfaces. We're all so familiar today with, with iPhones and, and iPads. And honestly, it's the same thing with the kind of platforms we use. Um, you know, anyone with, with, with use and knowledge of trade uh, can very quickly assimilate and start using the platform in, 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 in immediate uh, opportunities. There's a big push and one of the big pushbacks I've always had has been around sort of data security and the issues around that. The one thing I can tell you, and I'm not a data expert, is that uh, we see the FBI, the Fed, um, and many, many companies um, spending uh, a lot of time and effort, US government, using things like Amazon Web Server. And you think to yourself, if, if we all outsource so many different things to different businesses, then surely outsourcing data to people who spend their life protecting it has got to be a better solution. And, and we've seen banks taking a different view as well on that part as well. So I would encourage us to say, let's be real, let's be look at it, and let's try and consider what the risk profile is in these scenarios as well. Our solution for, 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 for everyone's sake is obviously can be done on-prem, but I think the ability to be able to do a, a cloud agile environment has become very, very easy. And, and, and so I'll just finish up because I know we, we are kind of tight on time, but I wanted to just say that, you know, listening to banks, we, we have a solution in the market that we've we recently sort of um, released, and I think it's been in the press quite publicly, which is very much a pay-as-you-go kind of in a box model where literally in a few hours we can get you up and running and using the platform. So we've had a big uptake in that from customers, which has been exciting. Um, we've seen a lot of opportunity where customers who perhaps don't want to go down a big route and a lot of time and effort using it as overspill, using it as, as, as part of their modus operandi, using it as, um, as an additional check. But we are seeing that very, very quickly. And I think with automated digital environments that we work in, where you can access and view data and do things very quickly, I think these sort of tools are becoming more important. And, and you know, to the point um, that was made earlier by uh, by Sam as well, that you know, standardization is going to become critical. And you know, Yari also made this point earlier about the fact that well, who do we go with, and how do we go with who, and if we go with them, are we stuck with them? Is there going to be a chance to move to somebody else? And I think solutions today, and I think you know, Bolero would also talk about this, allows banks, corporates to change their needs as and when they want. I think in the past, you invest a lot of money up front and you put all these platforms and you spend all this money. We don't have to do that today. Today, you can use a platform, you can try it for six months, one year, see how it goes. If you want something else or you like something else or your priorities change, then that can be done very quickly. And we've tried to make that very agile, very cognizant of that fact. And this trade serve opportunity we've done does exactly that, allows you to come in and out as you want and i'd be delighted obviously to talk to people about that but i think digitization is very much the theme we're very much looking at how we can help customers through this process through what is a very difficult time and we believe you know out in the box easy solutions to deploy are, are the way forward and i think it's possible to be achieved today so uh, thanks andre and i'll, I'll uh, pass it on to to, to um Valera. Thank you, Uzer. Indeed, you can digitize the trade back office um, independently of your counterparties and, and benefit from, uh, indeed, um, uh, increased efficiency and accelerated processing. Um, now, let's look at a, a second option uh, when it comes to uh, e exchanging information on bills of lading, for instance, with your counterparties. Uh, tell us more, Yako, about how COVID-19 is implementing or impacting your, uh, your business. Thank you, Andre, and uh, indeed, thanks for having the opportunity to talk uh, in this uh, in this setting. Um, I'm going to be a, going to be a bit provocative uh, on some of the topics. Um, so I have a few bullet points here, and I'll talk to each of them. Uh, not too long, don't worry. Um, but the first thing I would like to state is, you know, let's not forget that about 80% of global trade business is done on open account. Um, I see many COVID publications um, that focus on, you know, the impact for the banks you know, from an operations perspective, from, uh, you know, how to go about certain procedures. 
um, but 80% of global trade is done on open account, as we all know. Um, I also raised this in the, in the ICC uh, internal meetings that, you know, also from an ICC perspective, we need to think beyond just the banks and just the bank transactions. So that's one point I wanted to make here. Also, the corporates, of course, they are in survival mode right now. They are trying to keep the business running as well as they can. They're trying to do global trade as well as they can. Um, they will become creative. Um, so I think also from a bank perspective, we need to think along, and I'm now talking as a former banker, along with these clients, how can we support their business? Um, for them, risks will go up. That's definitely a case because their counterparties will probably be less uh, solvable. Uh, solvable. There will be less. Um, there will be the, the credit risks will increase. So there will be an, an increased need for risk mitigation over time. Once hopefully things will get back to normal. And if if the banks cannot support these clients, then you know probably they will stay with open account or even move more towards open account. And that could mean you know that they will start to increase more risks. But it can also be a, a revenue impact of course for the banks um, on you know e-presentations and the use of electronic document uh, documents under trade transactions um, actually you know um, Swift was mentioned also in the in one of uh, one of the previous by one of the previous speakers we've been around for more than 20 years you know as, as sort of offspring from Swift and you know with EBLs already from day one multi-bank connectivity but like for instance supporting traditional trade with electronic documents with e-presentations we have been doing that since 2010 and uh, from our perspective Asia Asia Pacific has been ahead of the digitization curve for a long time already that's where the, the bulk of the volumes has been historically and actually other parts of the world have historically been lacking behind um, even goes for Europe, you know, I'm based in the Netherlands, um, but also countries, you know, around me and on the other part of the globe have been traditionally lagging behind. Commons, and you know, I, those of you who know me know that I've been more than 30 years in trade and, you know, for the last 10 years I've been preaching digitization for trade. Something needs to change in this dinosaur environment. Um, but lots of times I got the comments, especially from the bankers, but also from some of the corporates, if it ain't broke, then don't try to fix it. But guess what, today, today with COVID-19, things have broken. So we need to fix it and we need to act and we need to look forward. Um, I, I, I hear comments you know that uh, the, the process you know, fails if, if you can't do end-to-end -end with an electronic bill of lading. Well, that is not really true. You know, even if the process fails, for, uns, for instance, at the end of the transaction, at the port of destination, at that point, you can always go back to paper and request the carrier locally, uh, ideally even at the port of discharge to produce a paper bill of lading to replace the electronic bill of lading. And then you still have the advantages of the electronic document, you know, starting from the carrier, through the shipper, through the banks, and even up to the applicant. So there are ways around it. From a pragmatic perspective, it works. Um, from our perspective, you know, we have the infrastructure, we have the Bolero network, you know, connecting all these banks and corporates and carriers around the world. We have a legal framework that enables these transactions and these, these, these electronic bills of lading to work, which is called the Bolero Rulebook. We have the tools. Actually, right now we are, we are launching our, our new user experience, you know, the Galileo platform. So it's easy for corporates and banks and carriers to have a very interesting user interface where we will also be adding value added services, you know, like we're working with TradeStream. Um, the rules are there. Um, Sean mentioned the EUCP, you know, you now have the 2.0, you have the EURC for the documentary collections. We had the, the, the URBPO, of course, for the BPO transactions. Even the URDG uh, enables, you know, electronic documents to be used. Um, I think what needs to happen still is that there needs to be a paradigm shift that, you know, for, for some people in the trade finance industry, that we first need to have, you know, things in, in global legis legislations around the globe, that we need to have global standards, that all the regulators need to approve things. I think it works the other way around. I think you just have to get going and then over time standards will evolve and standards will you know, get established. Um, if, if, if you wait until with moving until everything is in place, you know, chances are that things will never happen. Thank you, Jaco. Uh, next. 
I have yep. more. I have more. Yep. I have more bullet okay. points. <laughs> Sorry. Yep. So um, global trade finance uh, digitization faces a tipping point now accelerated by COVID-19. Yep. Just, just as an observation from our perspective, what we notice is to give you one example, one of our major carrier clients has quadrupled the number of electronic bills of lading in the month of March. And those numbers were not uh, low to start with. Um, so you see that things are happening already. Now we don't see similar increases you now from the banks. So these must be used for open account transactions. Another indication that the corporates are already moving forward in digitization based, based on this, uh, this COVID crisis. Um, we do see our effort right now internally within Bolero and increased interest from banks. Some banks we've been talking to for years um, that uh, fortunately uh, have now signed up, signed up also quickly to be able to do e-presentations to help their customers. Um, same goes for some corporates who had digitization on the back burner uh, and suddenly it has moved forward. So that's great. And also to, I know India was mentioned. Uh, we also see that as well. Um, you hear that, you know, India is very much affected from, you know, papers being stuck. And so we see definitely there that they already were making very, very big progress in, in digitization. You know, we work with the major corporates out there, um, but we also see that the banks are gearing up more and some of the corporates are indeed, you know, also joining now quickly to move to e-presentations there as well. Um, Next bullet point, banks and corporates realize that business continuity planning scenarios are stressed if paper gets stuck. Indeed, if the paper gets stuck, then the processes fail. Um, I think COVID-19 is, is, is a huge wake-up call for, um, for BCP in general. Um, I think as a recommendation or as a suggestion, I would say, you know, we have all these letters of credit out there. Um, you know, if the client should still prefer, you know, paper presentations, then at least, you know, uh, have uh, clauses in there that in case of disruptions, you know, uh, you can turn to EUCP so you don't have to amend DLC on the spot. But even, on, even when you issue it, you already think ahead, you know, if something happens, uh, you know, then we already have that, uh, that clause within the letter of credit. Um, and also, you know, if, if, if the documents don't reach the parties, the, the paper documents don't reach the parties, any BCP process will fail. Because if you don't get the documents, it won't happen. Um, last two points, um, the use of electronic documents would have reduced the impact on documentary trade during the crisis. I think that's stating the obvious. Um, but on the other hand, it's of course still strange that the, the trade business line is still so paper intense. Um, there are many reasons for that, but you know, um, I think if you still today walk up to a trade finance operations department in the bank, you know, it's, it's like moving back in time uh, when you see the piles of paper uh, uh, lying around there. And uh, of course, you know, from, from, a, from an automated checking perspective, you know, it makes total sense to put tooling in place. And of course, that's also uh, why we work also with uh, TradeStream from our side. But if the paper documents don't reach the bank, um, you can't do the scanning and you can't do the OCR. So then it also is you know, interesting to have the electronic documents to be used in such a scenario where they can, of course, you know, come straight from the source or in a PDF format. You have the data to which you can use to do your checking as well. So I think, you know, disruption has happened. Um, John mentioned, you know, there's potentially a second wave of COVID-19 coming. So we need to think ahead with, as an industry, you know, how can we avoid you know, these BCP processes to fall over again. Um, last thing, and then I'll, I'll, I'll hand back, uh, Andre. Um, open account can quickly adopt, uh, but documentary trade needs to prepare for next steps. Um, if you look at to the publications, you know, the recent one from the World Trade Organization, they expect that global trade will drop uh, anywhere between 13 and 32% uh, in 2020. Um, but we all know it will bounce back, you know, all through crises, wars in the past, trade has always bounced back eventually. So it will come back. Um, companies will go into trouble, as I said, so the need for risk mitigation will increase over time. So I think personally, over time, LCs will, you know, uh, the numbers and the volumes will rise. So we have to prepare. Mm. Also, what we shouldn't forget is if the business bounces back, and people start to send paper documents around again, then those documents will hit the existing backlog piles 
in post offices at couriers. So even fresh sets of paper documents under trade transactions will probably get delayed anyway. Um, so to wrap it up, I honestly feel you know that COVID-19 is the tipping point and probably the, 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 the situation needed for the trade finance uh, world to, to, to move towards digitization. We're here for you. We have the infrastructure. Uh, we have the technology. We have the tools. Just give me a buzz and I would love to talk to you how we can help you in this scenario. Thank you, uh, Jaco, fully agree that uh, this is not about addressing issues only for the next few weeks, but for the next few months, for sure, and, and years, of course. Uh, moving on, uh, I will cover in the interest of time this briefly, because ITFA will come back on uh, the digital negotiable instrument initiative. We're going to uh, come back to you, to all the members uh, in the coming uh, two weeks on uh, the work we have been doing for bills of exchange and promissory notes. So don't confuse that with the bills of lading. This is a separate uh, uh, type of, of instrument here, uh, working with digital uh, document technology, digital signatures and DLT, and uh, working with multiple uh, fintech partners of ITFA like Enigio, Time, TradeStream, China Systems, uh, Finan Exchange and others. We are uh, looking at indeed helping uh, financial institutions, platform providers, um, digitize uh, natively those uh, negotiable instruments. I won't expand here uh, in the interest of time because I want to uh, come back to the bankers and asking them, we have looked at various technology options and there are many more, um, what, what the banks are doing uh, concretely these days uh, with respect to those technologies and how, what kind of advice can they give to, to our audience? Uh, John, can, will, shall we start with you? Yeah, sure. So, so look, I think we, we're splitting the conversation into two different pieces at City. The first is the, the back office operations that we have. And is there technology that we can deploy that really takes out the human element, right? So, you know, we're, we're in conversation, we're, we're uh, members of a lot of the consortiums. We're having conversations with TradeStream. Well, I mean, we're looking at, so how do we make this a much, much less people intense business? And there's an enormous amount of work going on there. And then the second part of the conversation, and this we think is less in our control, is how do we digitize the whole experience and how do we work with, with our clients, right? And, and there, there's still a lot of work to be done. Again, I, I believe in the early days, there were some you know, early adopters to this technology, but it wasn't really widespread. And I think now, I think there's gonna be much more interest from corporates to really move to a much more digital agenda. And the question is, you know, what's the right solution? How does it work? How do we get scalable? So we're really, really splitting the conversation. Then the other thing I think is, is you know, kind of interesting, and it's, I think, a positive out of the whole, whole experience, is the fact that innovation is really, really going, you know, much, much quicker. So, you know, I'll give you another internal example from City, but, you know, the conversations about digital signatures has been going on for probably a year and a half with different people opining and giving their views, et cetera. And, you know, what we couldn't accomplish in a, in a year and a half, we got done in about two or three weeks. So, you know, there is a huge opportunity for us internally to very much be able to move the agenda much, much quicker than we've historically done. And we're really trying to concentrate on that. Thank you, John. Uh, Vinat, uh, on, on your side, what are your concrete plans to, or what kind of technologies are, or are you already using? Uh, and the ones you want to, to add in order to address those issues? If we still have Vinod on the phone. Or if we don't, uh, uh, Samuel? Yep, uh, I'm here. here. Vinod, are you here? Yeah, but Sam, why don't you, Tim, you got to the uh, mute button faster than me, so please carry on. <laughs> Okay, all right, I'll go ahead. So uh, look, I, I, I think similar to what John said, but let me just break it in, uh, into maybe four buckets. I think, I think um, you know, what banks are doing, uh, uh, at least what we are doing is looking at it in four, uh, with four lenses. One is how do we interact digitally with clients? How do we, and what do we do and what technologies we do uh, or deploy internally in our back office? 
how do we interact with counterparties? And then cutting across all of this is how do we use data, uh, whether it's for insights and whether it's for uh, risk mitigation. And, and that second part of, of risk mitigation is very important, especially when it comes to things like fraud, um, uh, detecting frauds, uh, et cetera, very early before it happens. Because one of the things with digital uh, and working off data is um, that, that you know, it does also increase risk uh, if you don't mitigate and put controls in place. So let's talk about the three buckets. So how we interact with clients, I think like John was saying, things that have not moved uh, um, in the past because of either latency of clients or, or because of uh, you know uh, our own latency internally with compliance, et cetera, um, we have seen a huge demand. And in fact, we are converting on many of those opportunities into digital interactions, whether using our own proprietary platforms, third party platforms, um, that are on the call today, whether it's straight stream, whether it's S-Talks, Polero, in terms of how clients interact with us. We are, we are part of all three, for example. Our own back office, I think OCR NLP uh, uh, was referred to earlier, and we are indeed working with players like TradeStream uh, to try and try and drive efficiencies because yes, we all want to go digital, but the paper might be here for uh, the foreseeable future. Uh, and, and to that extent, we need to drive efficiencies. So that's more back office automation, OCR, NLP, et cetera. And the third part, which is a part I referred to earlier, how do you deal with another bank that is on a completely different, uh, they're also digital, but they're on a completely different digital platform. And how do we get the two platforms to interact and talk to each other? I think that's a trickier bit. Uh, and there it's about, um, you, know, uh, you know, getting onto the same uh, platform or at least getting the platforms to talk to each other or to the extent it is not digital documents and look at other solutions where we can work together. So I would say it's those three buckets and then data cuts across all of the, and those. Uh, even before the COVID crisis, uh, there's been a huge focus on data uh, in terms of um, you know, uh, risk mitigation as well as opportunities. And I think the risk mitigation piece is of paramount importance from a forecasting perspective. Oil has gone from whatever it was to uh, sub 30. Um, what does it mean? Um, you know, uh, earlier, I think Jacob uh, talked about the impact of uh, WTO came out uh, yesterday and talked about at least a 30% drop in trade. What does it mean? The modeling for forecasting of, of, of risk, which sectors are gonna be stretched, I think also is gonna be of paramount importance when we look at uh, uh, data as a, uh, as a tool to uh, do risk mitigation. Thank you, Samuel. Indeed, let's uh, hear from uh, Vinod about the, the technologies in place as well as those that you want to, to add. Thanks, thanks, Andre. Um, in fact, it's even tougher to go after both John and Sam. The most points are covered. But I think what I'll bring in is markets in Africa are at varying stages of evolution. Uh, what works in South Africa doesn't necessarily work in Nigeria. Um, and what I'm and what and this would have been true in most situations, except for what we see as the immediate out, kind of outcome of COVID-19. I always use one example. We have been using trade stream in Uganda for some time. And uh, as both John and others have mentioned, uh, we were trying to roll out trade stream into South Africa for a few months. And kind of uh, suffice it to say, uh, it was always, uh, there was always another project which was more important. Uh, within, shall I say, I mean, uh, we chose to then say, okay, let's go and roll this out in Ghana and Mozambique, which is going at a good pace. And since one week now, South Africa has been knocking on the doors to say, we desperately want fair stream. And the reason is very simple. It actually allows for digitization of a workflow, which otherwise was amazingly manual. Uh, and that is just one example. I mean, we could talk about uh, what technologies are being used as far as robotics is concerned, as an example. The, the rollout of robotics specifically in terms of guarantee processing has actually helped the whole BCP implementation. Uh, it, it would have been particularly chaotic that the teams had to split up into different locations as far as BCP implementation was concerned, but the rollout of robotics has is that. So to my mind, actually, uh, the ask is there. Now the question, kind of what we are contending with very frankly is, how do we actually allocate the scarce resources we have to get the right kind of traction in the various markets? Uh, that I think is a problem, a good problem to have. And I think that's a problem that most banks must be kind of working with. Um, otherwise, nothing more to add. Back to you, Andre. Thank you, Vinod. Uh, uh, Sean, on your side, what is SMBC doing concretely 
as we speak? We heard yeah. about the signature. So, I mean, speaking now as a banker rather than as chair of ITFA, uh, I think it's, it's, it's relatively well known that uh, SNBC has invested a lot in the Marco Polo platform. Now, um, to be honest, I think at the beginning, it was a little bit of sort of presenteeism. This is the, the new kid on the block. Let's get, let's be one of the cool kids. Uh, you know, if, if, even if that was the reason, I think it was it was a very good decision because what we we currently have now within SMBC is a a very solid platform and and I think you know, people have made various points from City and Standard and Standard Chartered um, about the 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 different services that are being that that are being useful to them, but I I want to make a, an, an, another point which is that you need to have a core platform uh, to be able to feed those systems in and actually really optimize their return and their value. So for us in Sumitono, that's been, uh, that's been, uh, that's been uh, uh, Marco Polo. Uh, and at the moment, those of you who follow Marco Polo will know that it's actually what's on offer in terms of customer, uh, customer available products uh, is actually at the moment relatively limited. It's going very fast. But what it does offer is the ability to plug in a lot of these things that we've talked about KYC AML utilities, registries, um, uh, SDOCs and Bolero, the, the EB, EBL, EBL providers, um, optical recognition to make it a, a whole straight through process. One of the things I actually I spend a lot of time on, and this really takes me outside of my comfort zone as, as a lawyer and as a banker, if you like, is actually spending a lot of time on IT. So integrating um, these these, these client uh, facing systems generally because of course that's where the selling point is you can you can take a Marco Polo and you can market to your customers but then actually tying that into the back end has been uh, ha has been quite difficult we don't just use Marco Polo we use other ones um, uh, Congo for example is one that's been very heavily taken up by the commodity traders that has different integration um, issues. Uh, so I, I just, I, I really want to make this point about having a really solid platform that is as versatile as possible. As versatile as the best platform is, you're always going to run up against issues around standardization. You know, this is the VHS Betamax issue. This is the reason why DSI, Digital Standards Initiative, has been set up uh, in Singapore uh, by the ICC because uh, we need to have common technical standards. I spent a little while talking about the common, or at least the 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 the, the mutually respecting uh, legal systems and regulations that we need. Uh, but all of this has to come together, if not globally, at least involving all of the or the majority of the uh, of, of the major trading countries. And that's where the ripple effect comes in. Um, that's what the WTO is doing. Um, that's what we're trying to do at it for with the uh, initiatives that we with the discussions that we have um, around around e-signatures. But so I, I just really want to make that point. It's 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 very uh, it's critical to choose a platform that is the best platform that you can afford, but the most versatile. Thank you, Sean. Uh, I'd like to um, uh, highlight one question we got from Mizan Bank. What sort of uh, robotic process automation are the various banks using in trade uh, finance? Does John Vinod? So Samuel this is yeah. Yes? So this is this is John, right? So we 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 where we're really using um, from a technology point of view, we're using imaging. We've been using imaging again for a long time. We did a partnership with a, a company to do OCR, optical character recognition. Um, that's actually gone very, very well. And then we're using natural language processing. We strip off all the proper nouns. We, um, we, we end up putting it into um, our OFAC filters, et cetera. And then we're on a project where it's using some robotics, but there's a project between ourselves, uh, um, ENY and COFAX, where we're and, and SAS, where we're trying to automate our KYC AML doing block doing um, using artificial intelligence to, to do like boycott clauses, etc. When we tried to do robotics, honestly, it really wasn't that beneficial for us. We did not get 
kind of uptake that we 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 wanted. And to me, and this is probably a controversial statement, but robotics is really trying to fix an interface that you built wrong the first time. So we've done some stuff in robotics, but it really has not um, proven to be a very good investment for us so far. I don't know how it is for the other banks. Any comment from Vinod or Samuel? Or, or uh, some, to, or? So, well, I, I'll, I'll, I'll take that up from the semi perspective. Not that different actually to, to Citibank. Um, there is the there is there are various initiatives, um, but uh, for, for 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 robotics within within the bank, uh, none of them have been particularly successful or um, had much application actually to trade trade finance. Um, and there may be cultural reasons for that, but uh, if I go back to the point I was making about the platform, um, it may be that this is actually another way of achieving um, this kind of this kind of automation. Uh, it, you know, it doesn't have to be robotics. It can be through blockchain or through APIs or through something else. Uh, I mean, the important thing is that you make it uh, you make it efficient. Um, and these days, of course, with as little human intervention as possible. Okay, so moving on, uh, we have a question for the technology providers uh, from Axis Bank. So uh, the question is, how many days uh, would be required uh, for rolling out and implementing a, a trade stream or a Bolero solution? Uh, Uzer? Um, I'll go first if I can. Yes, so, so yes. for us, um, as, as I think I mentioned, and thank you for the question, for as I mentioned, we are, we, we built a platform with this, this platform called Trade Serve, which you can be live next week if you want. Um, I mean, literally it is that easy. Um, we've listened to the market. We know that there are various ways you can train platforms and machines to learn documents, but actually we've come up with a solution which allows customers to literally go on within within two or three days. So, and we have, you know, strong teams behind us to be able to partner on that. If I can also just quickly, if I may, Andre, one say one thing, because there's been a bit of a theme in the conversation around, around partnerships, around uh, connectivity, and that's certainly something that we 100% applaud. I mean, we connect to most backends for trade platforms, but also, you know, increasingly the likes of, of, of Comgo or uh, Contour and the other big providers that we're seeing coming into the market. And we see ourselves very much as integral and complementary to those to be able to connect them as well. So, so I absolutely support the idea of partnerships and we're very much in favor of that as well. Thank you, Zer. Jaco, you want to yeah. handle the question? Yeah, I, I totally, totally echo that. You know, we are also, you know, partnership is key these days because, you know, there, there's no one solution that has everything. So you have to partner up with, you know, best in class providers uh, in their respective uh, areas. And then ideally, that's also what we're going to do with Galileo. Uh, have at least, you know, the Galileo tool be the one-stop shop where, you know, uh, our clients at least can access these multiple applications and these multiple added uh, value added services uh, to the question on you know how quickly can you be up and running uh, at, uh, at bolero um, it's a, it's a SaaS based solution so it's you know it's it's a web-based solution so from a technicality perspective you know it's it's very easy what usually takes the longest because i understand the question came from a bank uh, usually take it takes the longest you know the internal processes within the bank the discussions and stuff. So, uh, from a uh, an onboarding perspective and up and running, uh, it 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 is yeah, it can be done very quickly. Okay, thank you very much. I think we, uh, in the interest of time, I will just uh, highlight a, a key message that um, we believe we have to work on in the coming months. Uh, definitely, COVID nineteen had the impacts on on business continuity. That was very clear, and and these are messages coming out of different. Uh, uh, sessions. There's an urgency for banks and corporates. We heard that as well. There is uh, plenty uh, of um, uh, choice for, for banks and corporates to uh, take advantage of uh, technology solutions. However, some of the impacts, the benefits from those technology solutions is often limited because of reg legal and regulatory obstacles, so policy uh, issues not accepting indeed uh, paper documents for the one or the other instrument. So I think that's where we need to uh, focus on in terms of making sure we unlock those uh, policy decisions in order to uh, help financial institutions increase their use of uh, technology. Um, there is a question on how, how to engage practically with regulators. Maybe Sean will want to take that one. 
Yes, so I mean, the way to engage to regulators is through associations such as us. Uh, we have engaged, uh, those of you who are our members will know that we actually have lobbyists now working for us in Brussels. We are uh, working with some of our members in the US actually to, to lobby the US government to provide public backing for something we haven't talked about today, but about uh, public uh, uh, credit risk insurance. That may be the subject of another webinar, we hope. Uh, so work through people like us, um, but work through uh, and through people like ICC. Um, that, is, that is the best way to do it. That's exactly indeed how we want to uh, uh, follow up on this uh, on this session, making sure we get the voice heard through associations. ICC has already been very active on some of the specific points, and there are additional points uh, not only on digitization but also, as Samuel said, on liquidity on on credit. So we're going to continue uh, organizing additional sessions. Uh, on those various uh, issues as an association. Uh, definitely the, the focus is on uh, the call to the policymakers, making uh, clear that the digital trade will not happen will, without their support and that uh, technolo uh, technology can bring far more benefits if and when uh, policy decisions uh, allow uh, for it. But in the meantime, indeed, there are already a, a series of technology solutions available, as we heard which uh, are, are bringing short-term benefits and, and which are compatible with the existing policies. So in the interest of time, I think we need to uh, close here unless uh, one of our uh, speakers want to make a, a final comment. If any uh, from Yari, John, Vinod, Samuel, Sean, Uzer or Yako want to make a final comment or statement. This is John. I would just, the only final comment I would make is let's not waste this opportunity. Everybody's focused, the clients are focused, the regulators are focused. I think we have a huge opportunity as an industry to really move forward and hopefully we all work together to, to really drive the, the needed change in the industry. Couldn't agree more, John. Thank you. So thank you very much to, to all of you who joined it. You were close to 200 and still are after 90 minutes. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you to all our contributors here uh, on the, the panel, the virtual panel, I should say. I got a, a few questions by email and through the chat around the presentation. Definitely, it will be available to you. Um, we'll make sure we'll uh, get this to you via email or via the ITFA website. And uh, similarly for the recording, the, this session has been recorded and will be also uh, accessible through the trade stream uh, uh, website uh, shortly and and as well as through the itfa website so thanks again thank you everyone. andre thanks for all your help and support on this has been great thank you great session thank you thank you thanks, andre. thank you thank you all thank you all bye thank you